Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Living Well with Dr. John, Adjustment Through the Lifespan. Before we begin, I'm going to share two webinar disclaimers. The first is, this is for educational purposes only. For psychological services, please contact your state psychological association for referral. The second disclaimer is, the questions, comments, and opinions expressed during this webinar may not express the views and beliefs of the Christopher and Dana Ree Foundation. Now for some background on Dr. John. Dr. John Chang is a clinical psychologist and is board certified in rehabilitation psychology. He's a professor of psychology at East Strasburg University, as well as a consulting psychologist. Dr. Chang also has a private practice through Doctors On Demand. Two quick notes before we begin. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on the ReFoundation YouTube channel. Additionally, if you would like to ask Dr. John a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. Now I'm going to turn it over to John. Hi, John. Hey, Kaylee. Thank you for the intro. Um, I'd like to always first thank Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation for this opportunity to bring this podcast to you once a month on the first Tuesday at two o'clock is usually what we try to hit. Um, it is uh, also like to thank Angela for our continued guidance and support of this podcast as we constantly try to make this work and um, information available to you guys and make this thing interesting to you. And lastly, of course, always Kayla, she helps me run this thing and go through my craziness to try to get this thing together. So today, today we're shifting gears a little bit on, on you. We're going to still talk about a psychological perspective on everything. However, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about activities, extracurricular activities, vacations, things of that sort, uh, at least in the beginning. We're gonna, and, and how does that impact your quality of life? I mean, we all know we would need to go on vacation. Don't get me wrong, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. Uh, but a lot of us don't go on and travel. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that in the beginning. Um, and as I was perusing, trying to think of what can I do this summer? What, what, what are some interesting things to, to think about and talk about? I remember an email uh, that was in one of our months where it was a Paul Bonger from Crab Sailing. And I said, you know what? That's interesting. I've never seen that before. So I contacted him and said, hey, you know what? Can you come on for a little bit? Tell us a little bit about your, you know, your foundation. So we're going to talk to Paul a little in a, during the podcast about some of those things. Um, now, uh, after that, we're going to talk a little bit of concerning questions and answers that I didn't get to from last month. And the ones that were provided this month. Last month we had two incredible interviewer uh, interviewees, and they were nice to come on, but it took up most of our time. So I, I'm going to rehash some questions that I didn't, didn't get to answer last week. Um, and then we're going to talk about the future July podcast and some of the ideas. Um, so those are the list of things we're going to hopefully do. So I'm going to start off with. Just why do we need to have vacations? I mean, why do we need to have social events? And it, com it comes down to uh, the bigger picture. Uh, and Kayla, if you can show uh, the quality of life scale uh, that was developed by Ferris and Par Powers way back in, I think in the 1990s, they did this. So there's several versions of this, uh, but the reason why social events and quality of life is part of all these things is that if you look at this questionnaire, what do they say, what do they ask when they say, or how is your quality of life? You know, what do they actually measure? And you know, as a person with spinal cord injury, you know, you think of the well, you know, what do we think about? when it comes to, am I living a good life? Can I, I mean, all the things we talk about, there's a lot of reasons why we can't live a good life, but then there's, for some reason, there are some people who can really do well. Um, you know, and if you look at some of these just first few questions that 
on these items, on at least this scale that's for spinal cord injury, it's about your health. It's about your pain. You know, is your ability to go to places, see things. We talk about sex already in, in one of our podcasts. Are you doing things for fun? Uh, you know, social, are you, do you have friends? Uh, do you have a job? Now I'm biased. Uh, being in education, being a professor, I'm all about having a job. I think having a job in, helps with a lot of these things. Uh, going on vacation helps with a lot of these things. These, when I say these things, I'm talking about different dimensions. Uh, now I cover psychological stuff for many months now. You know, your peace of mind, your faith in God, how do you see yourself? Are you happy? Uh, and, and the lastly, the family subscale, you know, do you have children? Do you have the ability to have children? Uh, you know, is your family happy? So, so, so if you look at this bigger picture, you know, why am I gonna talk about vacations today or, or the, the act of trying to have a vacation? So I am trying to, to go somewhere this summer. So I, I think uh, we're gonna try to go to Jersey, this somewhere in the shore down in New Jersey. And a few years ago, before the pandemic kick, we went down to the Outer Banks, which was a really nice place. But you know what? What's difficult for me to travel is that I have to lug everything, everything that's comfortable in my house that I know that I have and, and I have backups of things. All of a sudden I have to sort of lug it down to another location. And, and, and those who are listening today, tell me if this is an issue for you as well, but the two biggest areas that I've always thought was really difficult as a C5 quadriplegic using a power chair was one of them was the ability to transfer in and out of bed. That was, I was like, how do I do that? How do I bring enough equipment or people to do that? The ability to transfer, okay, that's one. Two, the bowel routine. That in itself was always a limiting factor of why I didn't wanna go. It's like, you know, having to do your routine in another place, another location, and the equipment and the caregivers to go along with that. So I rarely traveled because of those two issues. Now, don't get me wrong. I know there's a lot of people who can do it well, a lot better than I do. So I am not gonna give you advice about the travel aspect. There's, I know the foundation has many links to the different people and a few webinar, a webinar on, on the actual flying, et cetera. Uh, but, it, but as a, the psychological part, the getting ready to getting your lists together. Um, you know, I was watching one of the videos. It's like, what do you do? You create a list. And I create this huge list, a detailed list of everything I can think of to make sure I have everything. And my philosophy was the things I have to be able to get, I need to bring the things that I can buy when I'm down there. If something is missing or something breaks, that's sort of second priority. So medications, your wheelchair, your cushions, uh, two of everything, if you can, I obviously can't bring two electric chairs, but uh, sometimes I wish I could. Um, so, so going somewhere and bringing all these things along, doing your routines in another place is quite daunting, but it is definitely worthwhile once you figure out how to do it. Now, one of the things that I, is difficult for having travel and leisure activity for me is also finding a place that's accessible, especially with a roll-in shower. Uh, you know, I've tried to go places and say, I can go without showering, but the reality is I can't. 
I hate not having a shower. Um, it's, it's, for me, it's, it seems like it's a, I feel like I stink. I mean, literally I I'm oily and I, I need to get underneath that shower. So finding a house or a, a place that is accessible. It, it, now, when they say handicap accessible, that doesn't mean it has a rolling shower. It just means you can get into the house or get into the building or it has a grab bar here and there. Um, a lot of times they have steps to get into these showers. So you have to be very specific. Uh, I tend to try to call the places. I, I rarely book through websites um, just because that makes it harder. I, I like to ask a lot of questions. So if I find a place, I try to call and talk to the front desk if it's a hotel. Um, if it's a rental agency, try to talk to the actual uh, management system. So, you know, psychologically, it's very, very comfortable to do the same thing over and over again and never leave your house. Um, it's just, you know, it, it's just something that I know because we have so many issues. I have a, I believe I had a, uh, it was a, a question of specifically about that. Um, it, it was, it was a brain from New York, although I think the, uh, the mother might have just email for Brian and so if she says she writes I am a mother of a son T2 T3 SEI he has not uh, gone away since Zach's in 2016 um, now what would that travel entail now I'm looking at T2 T3 so that's you know a lot more hand function than I do and um, so in traveling it might be a lot easier for him and then myself but yeah, there, there are websites out there um, that try to help out with accessibility uh, information. And I think that's the key. Y you have to spend time on getting out there and getting information because without information, you can't make good decisions about that. And one of the biggest coping methods as a psychologist is telling someone to get information. Get information so you can make um, some good decisions based on information, not based on fear and process that. So I found a place in Cape May, New Jersey. I've been looking down, up and down the East Coast, trying to find somewhere that's a rolling shower and stuff, especially in New Jersey, since I'm closer to there. and. I ended up having to get a referral from a friend who said, look, this is where I stayed. Um, you know, so he knew personally about the place and which helped out because I just could not find anything on the internet. Um, but, but getting out, being with friends is one areas of having quality of life. Um, you know, having the energy to go away, to see new things, uh, real reinvigorate you. Now, uh, having activities. Now, one of the things I was really lucky when I had my accident um, and I was in McGee Rehab in Philadelphia, I joined as many group activities that was for people with disabilities. Uh, one of the areas that I joined was the Pennsylvania Center for Adaptive Sports. I think I have one of those, Kaylee, on one of the links for that that you can put up. Um, and, and again, I don't know currently what's happening after post. Uh, we're not, well, we're still in a pandemic, but if, if they're still open or not, but what I do remember going there and <laughs> trying new things. Um, let's see, what did I try? I tried quad rugby. Um, I played for the Philadelphia team. And I, I mean, I was so bad. It, it, it was really, it was really funny. It was, it, it's, it's like one of those comedy movies where as everyone's rushing down, I'm pushing down the, 
to the towards the other end and as everybody's going to get the other end I'm still barely turning around and trying to go the other way and uh so that as an athlete I was probably not very good and coming out from being a uh, state caliber wrestler and a, and a powerlifting champion for Pennsylvania I you know I that was an ego blast for me <laughs> to really be that bad but but you know what I enjoyed it wasn't the competition at that point for me it was the having the beers afterwards and hanging out with the guys and getting to know the people and and just living like a normal life even though you're disabled but and that's the nice part everybody uh, on the team obviously was in a wheelchair and then everybody around that supported the team uh, understood and never even looked at the wheelchair as an issue you know so so having the social events post injury immediately after the accident was one of the best decisions I ever made. So I did that. I tried the rolling. So they call sculling on the river, which I couldn't do really actually, but it was nice to get on the river. Um, I remember going um, gliding in an airplane. Um, that was interesting. And, you know, you're at that age, 19, you don't real, realize, geez, this plane doesn't have an engine. It just glides. It just, they tow you up and they let you go. And you're like, you just hopefully land okay. Um, I tried skiing uh, when I was a little older, uh, in my 30s. And man, that's a rough sport. If you want to, if you want to beat up your body and go fast, uh, that's the one you should try. And it was cold. It was fast. You're bouncing everywhere, and and I didn't last too long um, on that. And uh, let's see, skiing, sculling, gliding, quad rugby. Uh, again, the physical part is part of the process of the health and activities. It's the social part that really made it good. Made it important to me. Now, don't get me wrong. If you had AD, like I talked about last month, and we'll talk a little bit again, a little about that AD. If you don't have that controlled and figured out, um, it is just, it's not gonna, you're not gonna have option, opportunities to do as much of those things. Um, and that's the frustrating part. You know, am I gonna be healthy enough today to go do the things I wanna do? I talked to, um, uh, Dr. Dr. Kirsch from Mount Kessler one day, and he and he said, you know what, uh, you know, when you have an AD, you gotta check your skin, your bowel, and your bladder. Those are the three things you automatically gotta focus and make sure uh, that none of those three things are having an issue today, or at least at that moment while you're controlling your blood pressure. So, um, so we are one of the things that I saw online was. Um, crab sailing. Now, I have to admit, when I saw sailing, I'm like, wow, how does that work? You know, does, do I really want to get on the water? Can, how do they even get me on a boat? And what is that process? And, and I think I had a chance to talk to Paul a little bit, um, not an extensive chance, because I didn't want to, um, I always like fresh interviews. So I don't, didn't ask too many questions other than a few to make sure uh, he wanted to come on today and talk a little bit about some because from a psychology standpoint, what makes it hard for me to even go down, one is to travel. Okay, I had to figure that out too. Is the, you know, I'm gonna have to make sure I got all my ducks in a row and comes to my routine. You know, that get that gets a little easier now. Thank God Maryland's not that far, so I can just drive. I don't have to fly. Now, I know there's people out there who can fly better than I can. And so this is just my opinion. But when it comes to flying, they always destroy my wheelchair. Every time, no matter how many signs I put on my chair, don't pull this, don't yank this, don't. They inevitably do something wrong. And, um, and I have to say that there is, I had a 
question for that. And, I, and let me address that right now, since we're going to talk about, uh, I'm going to get Paul on in a second. We're going to show a video first, a little bit clip of crab so and then we're going to get Paul on. But one of the questions from uh, Ebenezer, um, they write, when traveling via air, what rights of refusal do we have with the TSA pat downs and checks with carry on bag items? My should be sterile catheter bag supplies have man manhandled by agents and gloves that were used during all their passenger check dots. Yeah, okay, can you imagine how dirty that glove is after checking every bag for the last 3,000 people? So, so one time they said, told me uh, you could say no. Um, I can, I can also remove my shoes, but it's hard. I also despise other passenger stairs, even though I'm sure they're just curious. When I get frisked, I still come up with a funny remark, can't still come up with a funny remark to offset the awkwardness. You know, so it, first of all, I, I did find out that there are things you can do to make that situation better. Now, I did not know these things, so I started researching about that. Um, if uh, Kaylee, if you could put the, I think you can have a card from the TSA that actually gives you your, uh, we'll show a link of that. And it says some modifications that you can have. Um, they ultimately still have a right to pat you down and all the things, but, but they will make an effort to try to make it more as comfortable, have privacy areas if you need it, instead of being out in public. Um, and uh, so there's a few other links there about TSA, specifically with their phone numbers on if you want to call them three days before traveling. Now, now when I flew out of Craig, uh, out of Denver, coming out of a surgery, uh, neurosurgery, actually, I, and um, I remember they sp specifically pat me down and, I, and they open, even open up my wound to make sure I wasn't carrying it. I'm like, are you kidding me? You just took a you just took apart my bandage. You took me, they took off my neck collar and all those things. So I was really, really frustrated and freaked out at that time uh, about the whole process, not realizing how it could have went better. Um, so I am constantly learning how to travel better. Um, I'm always not a great traveler just because I don't travel often, but when I do do it and I do it well, I'm like, I love it, I, you know, so I'm hoping, I'm truly hoping that uh, I can get on a cruise sometime soon because I've been on a cruise once uh, way back uh, early on in my injury and I haven't been in another cruise for over 25 years. And um, so I'm hoping to get back on a cruise once the pandemic gets done as well. So, so, so one of the activities that sounds really interesting to me is, is this crab cell. So I'm going to show a, a brief um, video on it, and then we're going to get Paul to come on to talk. He's the executive director. So, uh, hey, Kaylee, can you play that video for a little bit? We're here at Sandy Point State Park in Maryland. Today's clinic is sponsored by Disabled Sports USA and the Craig Nielsen Foundation. They gave us a grant to put on a sailing clinic, which will be a two and a half day clinic, and we will be instructing persons with spinal cord injuries on how to sail from the very basics to the final day of racing. My name is Josh Basil. I'm a C45 quadriplegic. I was injured 12 years ago. I was in waist high water in the ocean. A wave picked me up, dropped me on my head, and broke my neck. Well, I sustained a spinal cord injury in 2005 due to a gunshot wound. In September 2015, I had an autoimmune response to a virus. So ever since I got sick, I vowed that I would try as many adaptive sports and as many adaptive things as I could because I wasn't going to let it change anything. Came out and sailed one day and found my new favorite love. Sailing stuck out to me because I was actually able to do it all on my own. It's this new sip and puff system where I'm able to control the entire boat just with my breath. And to be able to have that independence and that control, I'm really excited to, to give it my go and to get really good at it. Yeah, I'll definitely be coming out with a little bit more to play with this. 
I'd love to like just race and go around buoys and try to go to the next buoy and uh -huh, get the best time I can possibly get. Yep, well, you get better every time. Josh invited me to sail today and I came with my dad and uh, the last time I sailed I was probably about 10 years old. It was really special to sail with my dad after so long. We'll remember this fondly. We're good. We're on the Hermit 3, Crab 3, Sandy Point. This is one of many clinics that Crab has held over the past several years. And we're very fortunate that our volunteer skippers have experience. They bring it to the clinics and we have our guests sailing the boats from the very beginning. The fact that we were able to work with Crab and do a classroom type setting and I got to learn all the basics before I got out there and then got to use all of those skills and knowledge on the water it was really awesome. You got out on the water and you were on your own, free from your wheelchair, not bound to anything. I learned a lot today with Phil. We had a lot of wind, so we started going fast and cruising, and I got a feel for how to steer the boat. I've tried surfing and skiing, some of the other adaptive sports as a quadriplegic. I need more help. Just a lot more hands on my body to help me, you know. But with sailing, I can actually do a lot more. I get to be in control of navigating the boat more. Abby, Bo, the skipper behind me. If I ever had any questions, get the answers I needed. But for the most part, I was getting a pat on my back saying I was doing the right thing. You're doing great. And just to be able to be out here and to do it on my own, my confidence levels went higher and higher the more I, the more I was out here. That's great. All right. That is that is a great video of some of the activities there. And uh, Kaylee, can we get Paul on here to say hi to us? Hello. John, how are you doing? Good, good. How are you doing, Paul? Very good. Good to see you. Good, good, good to hear you, hear from you now. Was that was I know I we went through a bunch of videos and we thought that was the neatest one about you know with of spinal cord injury and people and and participation from the family. What do you what are your thoughts on that? Uh, let me give you an update. Uh, the woman who spoke last, the brunette, uh, saying how much fun she had sailing with her dad. She just had twins um, the end of last year, and uh, so she's planning to come out sailing with her babies now so that's that's really, excellent really special really special and the other thing about danny is uh she actually raced in what's called the don backy memorial regatta and she won that race two years ago so she's she went from that elementary clinic to actually competitive sailing against other people uh with disabilities and she uh cleaned her clock so she wow. really learned a lot that's that's fabulous to hear you know paul when i when i think about sailing though i mean it, it seems like it's it just to me it's, it's such an elitist you know activity you know the people like me that growing up not being exposed to any water like that or any boats even uh, what, is, what does that mean for individuals like us who are not familiar with even boats? Well, I, I would say that your general statement is probably spot on, that most people do not get on boats. And the world is covered by 70% water. So there we are, you know, defining ourselves by staying on terra firma in these little areas. And what you've been talking about with this show is how do you get out and about? And what are you gonna do on vacation to go recharge your batteries and have new experiences? Well, you can keep doing it on land and you'll probably never run out of things to do, but if you really want to broaden your horizons and put your skills uh, to a higher level that you may not have known that you could do, Number one, get on a boat. Number two, actually sail the boat. And then number three, do it well with your friends or family as a team and really enjoy this physical activity together 
Uh, definitely not as rough as rugby. I'll, I'll second that, at least let's hope so. And uh, you, you just come away with an awareness, new knowledge, new experience that then can carry over into the other physical activities or sports that you take up. I mean, what, what is it like, uh, how many days does it take for you to actually learn how to um, sail a boat? I mean, I saw that there you have a whole bunch of crews that are very familiar with not only sailing, but people with disabilities, I guess. Well, it, that's a very good question because some people get on boats and they know how to sail the boat right away. They have the feel. So some of our best sailors are blind and they feel the wind on their face. They have the tiller in their hand and they feel the pressure on that tiller and they know what that balance should be and where the wind should be on their face to maximize the sailing speed of the boat. And so we get some people on boats who put their hand on the tiller and they are all over the place like the proverbial drunken sailor. And then there are those who just get it, they're in the groove and they, they're like, second nature, they have it. So there's probably no definitive uh, amount of time that it takes you to learn how to sail. It's, you know, getting the boat uh, properly uh, aligned and then working with the boat and letting it sail itself. Are there any, phys are there any physical limitations that, that just can't go out there? Do you have any, any limitations or, or is open season for anybody to just call you or contact you and say, can I give it a try? Well, Crab has been taking people sailing for over 30 years now out of a state park in Maryland and it's near Annapolis. And we have, real, we have Hoyer lifts, we have the transfer box that you see. So we have two methods of getting our guests onto our boats. We have racing car bucket seats with four point harness belts that you would put on to keep you in place so that you're not going to go anywhere. We have inflatable life jackets so they don't take up a bunch of space. They're not heating you up with having all this padding around you in the summer. So you can stay uh, cool. We keep coolers on the boats with ice that you could put a cloth in and then put around your neck or around your head if you were getting warm. Uh, because we know adjusting your body temperature uh, can be challenging. So we do everything for the absolute comfort of our guests, but we do want them to learn how to sail. And we put your hand on the tiller or on the, the lines controlling the sails so that you, you actually are feeling that, you're feeling the tug, you're feeling the pressure, and you're getting some exercise out of it. It's neurological, it's physiological, and it really makes you feel better when you get off the boat. Maybe a little bit tired, but uh, like Josh Basil showed in that Martin 16, with two straws, he was able, one to control the sails and the other to control the rudder. So, and he was someone who, that boat also has a joystick, but he said the joystick was too tiring for him. So he liked the straws. Right, right. And, and what is the best way to get on one of these boats? What is the best way to contact you? How, how does that work? Well, if you go to our website, that's a good start. And that's crabsailing.org. Or if you can't even remember that, that's okay. All you have to do is Google uh, adaptive boating and crab comes up we're the number one provider of this service in the country. And we uh, will then get you on the calendar to go out as a family sale. Uh, if you had a large enough group, uh, we can do group sales. So Josh has a posse of other uh, friends uh, in wheelchairs. So he brings his own group out that they're all together and you may have lunch with them there in the park. And uh, they just make a, you know, a real nice day of it as long as they wish to stay. Um, I guess the point I'd want to leave everybody with, too, is our biggest project right now, John, is to build a brand new adaptive boating center in Annapolis that will be the premier center in the entire country. 
and it will have all state-of-the-art floating docks where wheelchairs will be easily able to pass by each other, boarding equipment to get you on the boats. Uh, the center itself will have large instructional monitors, uh, even for the hearing impaired, visually impaired, you name it. It'll be a, an incredible training center where we'll run yoga classes, uh, maybe sitting, uh, volleyball, other kinds of activities like that in it. And we hope to open that in the spring of next year. Oh, that's great. That sounds like, sounds like you're moving forward, trying to make this completely accessible and available for uh, individuals like myself um, who are uh, looking for new things to try in some safety, uh, with some safety aspect. Um, is there anything else that, uh, that we should know before we even attempt to even try to to do something like this? Is, is there anything specific that uh, you need to let us know before I, people start looking at your website and looking at saying and trying to sign on? Actually, uh, it's, it's pretty basic. Uh, dress so that you're comfortable. Uh, you, the temperature on the water sometimes can be cooler than land. And so you wanna be able to have layers. If you're in a chair and you know you're going to be in a Hoyer lift to get on the boat, it doesn't hurt to uh, have the sling underneath you in the chair. So it's already there and ready to be hooked up to the Hoyer lift. Uh, bring your own uh, bottle of water. Other than that, get ready to have uh, your hat on. Your Nike Just Do It hat is perfect. Uh, some sunscreen on your face and you're good to go. And I assume you just throw your cushion onto whatever that seating you have so that you're comfortable in your own cushion and, and then and you sit on, you know, all those harnesses, I guess, right? If you need it. Right. Some, some guests like the bucket seat. It's very curved. It's very uh, form fitting, but others take the seat out of their chair, put in there. Uh, and then we adjust the, the harnesses so that they're very comfortable for you. What I liked about the, that end of that last video, um, Paul, is that, you know, as a psychologist, I'm always about relationships and and for her to say that she had a chance to sail with her father again, it, it, it was pretty special to her, it sounded like. It, it was, and he came out a couple of times and uh, you'd be surprised by the number of uh, our guests who come with their family. And so there'll be different children, uh, able-bodied, and in some cases, two people, uh, two children in a family may be disabled. And, and there's really no limit on developmental disabilities or physical disabilities. Uh, we, we look to accommodate everyone and, or they'll bring their friends to go out and have a good time with their friends. And then they'll go to lunch afterwards and talk about what they learned sailing. And that's what I like. I like the fact that you can bring other people who are part of your life that do experiences together so um so that well I, I wish you luck paul i thank you for coming on and uh explain this as we are you know as i try to seek things for my viewers to listen about and possibly get them to try uh, activities and but thank you once again well john we look forward to seeing you at crab this summer okay great take care paul have a good day okay bye-bye now I have to tell you, I have no, I have no relationship to any of this crab selling. Uh, I'm not being paid for doing this. I just thought, wow, that was an interesting thing. As I was searching for things to do this summer, post, I'm hoping this is post pandemic summer, as all of us are going to get vaccinated or not, or at least enough of us that we don't have to worry about this pandemic issue. And, and, and when this came on in my search, I was like, oh, that, and, but you know what? I, I was really concerned that, geez, I have no idea what sailing is about. I, you know, every time they, when you watch us, the, uh, a movie on, and they say starboard and, and, and port, I still don't know which side is starboard and which side is port. You know, is that right or left? You know, so, and again, and, and with my luck, with my luck, if you ever seen that movie, The Perfect Storm, you know, where everything just comes together at one point, my luck, I'll get out there on a boat and we'll, it'll be nice and sunny. And all of a sudden there'll be a perfect storm and this big gale will come through and turn the boat over on me. So, you know, that's probably with my luck on that. 
But um, I have to thank Paul from Crab Selling. Uh, he sounds like a real nice guy. And they seem to have a lot of things that, uh, you know, we can try. And, and those of you who are looking for something new the, this summer, seem they, they have everything set up for like us people with disabilities. And uh, so give that a shot. Um, so I am gonna, gonna go through and check out some of the questions that if you, if you have any questions for me uh, at this point, feel free to drop me a little questions on the chat um, and we will try, I'll try to answer some of them. So I'm gonna go through a few of the ones that were sent from last, last month and this month that I, and I'm gonna apologize. I, I did not go over some of these specific questions. And, and so I'm gonna try to go through some of them right now. So, Wendy says, what are some health issues in aging with SCI and related disabilities? Uh, this aging is always a big, big one for me because I'm a gerontologist. My, my scientific, my postdoctoral fellowship was in geriatrics. So I'm always about the aging. And what, what I've learned about the aging process with spinal cord injury is that you are going to start to experience things about 25 years earlier than what older people experience, you know, going into their elder time, you know, older times, you know, from osteoporosis uh, to joint issues. Uh, those are, those things are hitting me already. And I'm only 50 something and, and I'm having issues that are, you know, 70 something years old person have. Now I'm, I'm post 33 years. So can you, can you still have a good life? Yes, but as many of my, many of the viewers talk about, we have to control our pain. We have to control our caregiver issues or at least attempt to control some of these issues. We have to attempt to control some of the AD issues that comes up. Now I did see a study that's, that showed that long-term wise, again, I, I've said this before, the first 15 years post-injury for a young individual, life is pretty stable. The body's fairly stable. And it's a good time to get your degrees because it seems like for many, after 15 years of post-injury, the body starts to wear out. They start to feel some of these other issues. And, do, and one of the questions is, do AD seem to be occurring more often after, you know, as you get older? And for me, the answer is yes. Um, no matter what I do, what kind of meds I'm taking, it's, you know, the other day, uh, I was on um, two days ago, I woke up pounding headache, uh, blood pressure up 190. And you're like, what the, I'm just waking up in the morning. And, um, so you, you know, for me, it's like, check my, go through my uh, logistics, uh, bladder, bowel, uh, skin. Okay, that's everything's checked out. Then I get out and get out and sit in my chair, you know, sit up straight up because laying down doesn't help. And so, so you, you go, and then the option of taking medicine or not taking medicine. Uh, and so those are my regimen. And you need to talk to your doctor about that and say, you know, what do you need to do when you have these symptoms? And you got to have a list of just going down to bullet points and trying to make sure that you run through all those things, okay? Um, as a psychologist, these are things that what frustrates me. These are things that what makes us depressed, that makes us anxious about life. This, these are things that what causes us to isolate and be, you know, as I read through some of your comments over these many months, I hear things like, you know, I don't go out. I don't have many friends. I am uh, isolated uh, other than caregivers coming in and out. Um, that's, that's, that's hard for me to read that because I, I feel somewhat your pain um, to not be able to socialize in the world. You know, I hear about, you know, I haven't had a date in years, you know, and these things I really, really hope you can experience it still. And one of the best way to start to live a life is to go to these different activities, um, join a team. Um, it doesn't have to be a competitive team, 
and just join. I think, again, that's the best thing I ever did. Join quad rugby, um, go skiing, go skulling, go. I like what the video person, the person in the video who had the legs crossed. I was, I'm always uh, envious that people could cross their legs like that. Is it? And she said, and they're like, she's like, I'm going to try it as many adaptive sports as I can. Now, that's a great attitude because with that, there's so many benefits psychologically, um, you know, from self-esteem, from competence, from self, uh, from social interactions, um, not feeling isolated and alone. So so yeah, get out there. You know, again, we started with this by saying, look, I want to go on vacation. It is not about just being on vacation. It's, it's about so many things that vacationing with people brings about recharging your batteries, as Paul said, you know, being around people that care about you and living a life, being around people that understand the situation. So um, let me see, here are a couple of other questions that, you know, that I have to, that wasn't addressed last time. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, when someone writes, uh, and this was a question that was posted during the podcast, so I don't have any names or places or where they're from, but is it possible that a visceral return of sensation could set off AD? Does AD always mean that it body's in pain? or could experience a sensation return alone because said that often. Again, being a psychologist, I, I'm, and I'm not a medical doctor, but it does, not, does make sense that as a return in sensation, and for me, uh, it, I was always told that AD is a process of experiencing some sense of sensation. And, and if there's too much of a sensation, that becomes pain-wise, well, that's how our body reacts. Um, never had this issue. Well, if I, I mean, when I was young, I rarely had AD. Uh, it just wasn't part of my di daily life. Now it is part of my daily life. I literally check it every day to see where's my blood pressure. Now, uh, genetically, I, you know, there's just too much history in my genes to have high blood pressures and strokes and all those good things. And I'm trying every way not to have i mean i already lost my body i i don't want to lose my brain you know having a stroke is just a whole nother level of disability i, I don't i'll say like everyone else say I, I don't know if i can adjust to that one so uh, okay let's see growing old does it bring ad yes it absolutely do is it an unhealthy a denial if you don't think about it absolutely you cannot I'm going to recommend you cannot avoid making sure that is in control. Okay. But because you need to have that in control in order for you to travel, to play these games, to, to socialize. So have that issue. Um, how do you find a doctor who are trained, especially when you move in a new area? There are many qualified hospitals in the country that are specialized in spinal cord injury, but they are few. You know, it, here in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, for me, Kessler around here. And it is really, really difficult. And it's it actually quite frustrating to have to travel so far to see a doctor for some basic things. Um, but if you can, you should, because, you know, what recently, um, I remember I was just working with a, a local urologist and he had to do a cystoscopy, which is basically looking in your bladder and he found some things, took it out. Then he, you know, when I asked him what it was, he says he didn't recognize it, he just took it out. I felt better. Um, but when I talked to a urologist at Kessler, Dr. Liesenmeier, uh, he's right with it right away. He says, oh yeah, I know what that is. And you know, he explained what it is and he says, I see that all the time. And so again, it just it, it reinforced for me that I need to go to people that have good experience, but they are hard to find throughout the country. There are definitely large pockets of them in the major cities. Um, but 
you know, so you have to Google, do this good research on what are the best hospitals out there for spinal cord injury. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, so I'm finding, I, I'm in a rural area. How significant is isolation? Wow. Jeez. It, 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 we're social animals. We are, we need people. Uh, I mean, there's times where I wish I didn't need people to get up and didn't need people to go to bed and didn't need people to do the things I like to do. But, but in general, even if I could do them and I was a lower level uh, spinal cord injured, like a paraplegic, I would hope that I'm not isolated. And, um, and I think that was one of the curious things that I saw in research that more paraplegics attempt suicide than quadriplegics. And you're like, but that doesn't make sense. You know, you're a person with a significant disability. Why would you have less? And the rationale by the author was that because people who are high level injury like quadriplegics tend to have people around all the time. And that, that social interaction almost like acts as a buffer. Individuals who are paraplegics who are incredibly independent. I've seen so many then they bounce down stairs, they, they pop wheelies, they jump in and out of cars. Uh, they're very independent. Uh, I can see them not asking for help ever because they don't want to be relying on anybody. That in itself makes it that they are probably isolated more. Um, they, so, uh, so yeah, so being, so interacting with people, socializing, it's a key. Go to those places, um, try to uh, have a vacation if you can uh, as a family member. Now, I, uh, one of the other areas I try looking, oh, and again, I'm an information seeker. I looked at you know, RVs to rent or things like that, and that never worked out. I've never found any accessible RVs. I know Canada seems to have more of them than we do, but, um, you know, so that didn't work out. So, and I'm trying to avoid fry, flying uh, unless I have to. Um, but, you know, if you can, and I, I, like I've been down at Disney when I used to be um, down in uh, Gainesville, Florida, doing, uh, completing my education. You, you know, now you're two hours away so, from Disney. So of course you had to go. Now, again, that, that place is, at least it was really good to be able to get on some of those rides and experience things that everyone gets to experience. So, and so that was nice. You know, places that are large that who are used to having people with disabilities uh, can make your life a lot more enjoyable. Okay, let's see. What else do I have questions here? What is the most difficult issue that you had to adjust to with spinal cord injury? You know, the talk that my conversation is, you know, quality of life with Dr. John over lifespan. And I have to say, earlier on in my injury, the paralysis, the actual injury itself was the hardest thing to get, get around in the beginning. It was just like, I just didn't want to be paralyzed. I don't like being paralyzed. There's nothing beneficial from being in this life. Um, over time, you sort of have to accept it if you need to move on. So it changes. What I'm saying is, it changes as a, in my fifties and um, gone through a bunch of fertility stuff. And um, I don't have any children, unfortunately. I think I struggle with that. Um, knowing that, you know, it's lifespan is, is a lot less than the able body and, you know, you know, what kind of legacy I'm going to leave if, if, I, if there was any. And so those are some of the things I, I struggle with, um, with as I got older. So, it changes, it changes. Um, 
over time. If you would ask me that 25 years ago, you know, maybe 10 years post injury, and I probably would have said, I don't know, probably dating, you know, at that time, you know, being able to date and find quality relationships and things like that. So, so depending on how old you are and how many years post injury, those are the two things I would think would be a big factor in find and really determine what, what seems to be or the issue at the time. Okay. Let's see. Um, okay. So Virginia in Virginia says interested. She doesn't have an injury, but she says, Interesting hearing about successful living with people coming from challenging situations. You know, you know, as I, I, as I'm out there, probably more than most people when it comes to just bouncing around in society here, I am amazed at how there are, all, there are plenty of people who are successful in living with any form of disabilities. Um, there. There are plenty of them that could do it, but when it comes to running into them in this big country, sometimes it's a little bit harder. Although um, when you go to organizations specifically geared towards spinal cord injury, like you know the foundation um, an area, you know, it's, it's definitely av available. People are out there, meeting them is a little rare, but, but there's definitely people, I mean, I have a, friend who's a lawyer, you know, Juan, he, I have another friend who's just retired, who's retired medical doctor. Yeah. These are all quadriplegics. I have another friend uh, that I'm aware of that uh, I haven't talked to in a while, but he was, a, you know, he's a teacher, high school math teacher. So, uh, so we all uh, are out there. It's just, uh, <clears throat> it's just a little harder. It's definitely a little harder than most people life. Uh, Juliet says, you know, not being able to walk uh, is probably the hardest thing for her. Um, I'm gonna say to you from a psychology standpoint is that in order to successfully move on with the paralysis, you have to, you have to devalue walking. It has, you know, part of Wright's work way back in 1960. She's already, she already wrote, uh, she's the mother of rehab. And she, she said, look, you gotta devalue all those physical things you used to do because if you keep valuing them high, you're gonna just be frustrated. I don't get me wrong that you, you don't, you, sh you still should not be part of your value and you still get disappointed for not being able to do it, but you have to, just move away from that and start looking for other things to replace that. Things that are emotional, cognitive realm. And so that's the key. Are you able to have another area of your life that makes sense to you? That makes that you can be, you can, it can be valuable to you. Uh, yesterday we had a picnic my neighbor had a picnic. There was about 10, 12 people there in the out open. It was a beautiful day after a few days of raining. And I realized how nice it was to be around people again in a social situation. Um, you know, I'm a peop I, you know, I need people to have a life. And, and so that was valuable to me. Uh, being in a wheelchair to them, they don't, you know, they don't care. You know, they pick on me as like they pick on anyone else. You know, I'm part of the neighborhood crew there. And so that was nice. Um, so that was really nice. So let's, um, you know, we're, we've got about a minute left. And I'm going to tell you what we're going to talk about next month, hopefully a little bit. Um, so in the summertime, you know, the shift I've been sort of a little bit away, although it's still psychology based, it's a little bit towards the direction of what activities can we do? And I, I spent about four days trying to research um, 
how to play video games online and to see if I can do it. And that, oh my God, I, that's, you know, I, I'm, I'm the old age where I used to put a quarter in and then that's how you play a game now. You know, these, all these buttons and stuff and questions. And so I've been trying to figure that out. Uh, I've been trying to figure out some books on tape and get to read, listen to the things that I, I uh, don't get, ever, ever get to read. So we're gonna maybe talk a little bit more about those areas and how that enhances our quality of life and our uh, happiness, you know, down the road. So thank you again for listening to me. Uh, your time spent is your life, you know, time and life, they're all, this, all part of the same thing. And I really appreciate you listening and listening to me. Please send me some comments and messages on your evaluation to let me know if I'm going in the right direction for you. And uh, thank you again. This is Dr. John, talk to me, signing off, bye-bye. Thank you.